High Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Remember the movie The French Connection? Well, I have an Israeli connection. Her name is Stephanie. And she has led me to Yossi klein Levy and to Aviv Rediger. And now my new guest, Dan Palazar, is the executive vice president of Sholem College, the first liberal arts college in Israel. And he's got three sons in the IDF. I believe they're all in Gaza right now, maybe only two out of three. Dan, good morning. Welcome. Uh, where do we find you today? Uh, you find me back in Jerusalem, having just returned from a trip abroad to raise funds to provide gear for soldiers and having gotten in touch with each of my three boys. They've been in or near Gaza for the better part of this war since late October. And one of them was wounded, thank God, not as severely as many others have been. And I'll, I want to come back to that. But first, and I want to make sure people understand, Dan Palazar is raising $6 million because the IDF is short on some gear and not providing it. What are you raising money for, Dan Palazar? So we're raising money for the things that are most necessary to protect the soldiers. So if you think about protecting their bodies, they need tactical helmets that have a high ballistic rating. They need uh, ballistic glasses. They need ceramic bulletproof plates and vests to put them in. Um, and they need protective uh, earplugs that are selective. Uh, and then if you think about longer distance protection, they need to know about threats before those threats turn into ambushes that kill or maim our soldiers. So it's things like drones, surveillance cameras, night vision equipment. Uh, those are the main things that we're looking for, and there are a few other items. Where do people go if they want to help you do this, Dan? Because when you're vouched for by Stephanie, I know you're legit and a very responsible curator of their funds. So we're working with the Worldwide Friends Foundation and a uh, the discretionary fund for Israel as part of that. I can uh, send you a, a link for how people can contribute to that. We're very low key. Our group doesn't have a name. We don't have a website that describes what we do in part because these are the kinds of things you don't always want to put in writing, but people certainly can contribute. And I'm totally open to questions and comments and uh, any thoughts that people have. Please send that to me and I'll post it on my X feed. Now, Dan, uh, I'd like you to, I haven't had the parent of an active duty soldier on yet. There were 60 rockets fired from Lebanon this morning at Galilee. Your three sons are in Gaza or have been recently. What has this seven and a half months been like for a dad of soldiers? So what I'm going to describe about me is not unique to me. It's like probably any other parent who's, who's there. Um, the, my three boys are in different units. The oldest is in the reserves and he's in the infantry. My second oldest son is a, uh, a platoon commander in the Nahal infantry. He's doing his regular army service as an officer. And my youngest is a combat medic. And I'm always thinking about how things are going for them, uh, whether they're safe and such, whether they're doing well in what they're seeking to do, whether they're effective. Uh, so it's, uh, I've, I've never been this focused on my children before. And I have to say, and I think most Israeli parents are like this. I'm incredibly proud of my boys. I'm in proud. I'm proud of their service. They're stepping up. None of them would call themselves heroes to me. Every one of them is a hero. Uh, they're just quietly doing the things that need to be done. Because if you're a citizen of a state that's under attack and you have the ability to fight, to defend your state, you do it. And for them, it's, it's that simple. You know, Dan, I, um, I have a son, a son-in-law, and a nephew on active duty. They've all been in harm's way, but not like yours. I mean, they've actually been under attack, but not, it's not the Gaza grueling seven months every day. What's that toll take? Does it take a toll on a dad? So I have to be totally honest. It should. And most people I speak to are incredibly worried when they're in my situation. The first few weeks I was worried because I didn't know what it would be like and I didn't know how my boys would respond to being under fire and having grenades launched at them and uh, shrapnel and those kinds of things. That, and I was very scared how they would react. Once each of them had been in combat situations and had responded calmly and thank God had come through it fine, I actually ceased to worry. I can't explain it. It doesn't make sense. But when I think about my boys, I think about their heroism. I think about making sure that I do what I do, what I can do so that they're as effective in their jobs as possible. But I, 
I don't lose sleep. I haven't lost my appetite. I know statistically, right, each of them serves with people who have been killed. Those people are in positions parallel to those of my sons. There but for the God, grace of God go I and my wife and my whole family. So it's not that I'm in denial as to what could happen and what still might happen down the road. It's just somehow I've been able to focus on doing what I can do to help them and doing what I can do to, to help other soldiers. And uh, it's it might be irrational, but it's extremely functional. So I'm not trying to turn myself into a warrior. So Dan Palazar, tell me a little bit about your reaction as the father of three soldiers in Gaza to President Biden's arm embargo last week and the pressure on on Israel from the United States to essentially allow Hamas to win, to survive? Okay, so I'll have to start by saying as an Israeli, we were, most Israelis, myself included, were between pleasantly surprised and thrilled by the initial support provided by the Biden administration. And that support was both words and it was deeds and supplies. And to be honest, it lasted longer than I expected and longer than other presidents have supported Israel in situations of conflict. Uh, I might be disagreeing with you. I know you have a view on Biden, but I wanted to be honest. I assumed you brought me on to be honest. So yes. for months, the United States was very supportive. When, uh, when the administration seems to have taken the position that, well, this war can be ended, should be ended. Israel doesn't know, need to go into Rafah. Israel doesn't need to go, doesn't need to uh, have American arms for this next stage. Uh, my view was a typical Israeli view. We appreciated the help when it was offered. Now, to a large extent, we're on our own and we're going to fight on our own and we're going to win on our own. Obviously, I would be much happier if our leading ally were providing full-throated support at this stage as the leader of the Western world. That's what I would hope for, maybe even expect. But Israel was created as a Jewish state so that we could act independently. And even if we're totally on our own, we need to be able to fight our own battles. And now we're fighting our own battles. Uh, would be better if it were otherwise, but I remain very confident in the ability of the army to win this war. I can tell you that my sons and all of the soldiers I've spoken to say, we're going to win this with whatever we have. They would prefer, of course, to have the precision uh, weapons that the United States has spoken about stopping the shipments of because those precision weapons make it possible to destroy Hamas infrastructure and to kill Hamas terrorists with the lowest possible toll on Palestinian civilian life. Israel doesn't have the option of not fighting. So if you take away the precision weapons from us, what you're basically saying is we know you're going to go in. We know you're fighting to win. You're going to be causing more Palestinian casualties, which nobody in Israel wants. The soldiers certainly don't want. I don't want. So it's the opposite of the outcome that I would think the administration would like. But that's the reality we're in, and we'll do the best we can do in that reality. Now, Dan Palazar, I, I don't know your politics. I don't want to know your politics. I don't involve myself with the domestic politics of other countries, but Israel is our ally, so I am shocked that we are withholding munitions. Do you think the Rafah operation has to proceed in order to destroy? I've heard Prime Minister Netanyahu with Dan Senor this week say, look, we've just got to do what we've got to do. We've got to destroy the four battalions of Hamas in Rafah, or they'll just emerge from the tunnels and take Gaza over again. Do you agree with that? Completely. I don't see another <clears throat> defensible position, although I've heard that smart people have articulated other positions. It's very simple. Hamas did unspeakable, horrific things on October 7th, and its leaders have repeatedly promised to do them again. There is no plausible scenario for Israel that doesn't end with Hamas having been defeated and unable to continue its rule. And it's critical that everybody in the region, Palestinians especially, but Hezbollah and Iran know that if you cross a certain line with Israel, we will fight to the end to destroy you, not because we want to destroy you, but because we want to live and we want to build. The meaning of leaving Rafah intact with not just the four battalions that are kind of organic to Rafah, but to all of the other probably thousands of Hamas fighters who have fled there is... To, what that means is Hamas, the day after Israel pulls out, takes over the entirety of the Gaza Strip. They have victory pictures 
by the hundreds and by the thousands. And from the point of view of Hamas and the Palestinians, they have won. And from the point of view of the residents of the Gaza envelope who cannot return to their homes out of fear of Hamas attacks, it means they remain vulnerable. Dan, 50 rockets from Lebanon this morning. What do you think? And all of Galilee is emptied of of 70,000 residents. Do you think there is going to be a war in the north after the war in Gaza concludes? So I listen to the very smart people who you interview on your show, like Khaviv Retegor, Michael Oren, Yossi Klein Alevi. Um, pretty much everybody has agreed that Israel is going to have to fight that war. The only alternative would be for Hezbollah to change its spots and to pull back behind the Litani and demilitarize to a large extent. But I don't see that happening. I don't see anybody pressuring them. We so are a sovereign my, my country. My question is, what do you think? Is, what do your everywhere. sons think? Do they think this war is going to go on for another year? The war in Gaza? Um, no, it's just the war generally. Israel's been attacked by seven different fronts, if you count Iraq, uh, Syria, the West Bank, Iran, the Houthis, Hamas, and Hezbollah. I, I just don't know when this is going to settle down. What do the soldiers think? The soldiers think that this war is going to be going on, and the soldiers, as far as I can tell, virtually to a man, want to keep fighting until Israelis can live in peace. That's their job. They're soldiers. They have to defend the country. They want everybody to be able to return to the north where they live and to the south. So I don't ask my sons, do you think you'll be in for six months or for a year? We just talk about they're going to be in and they're going to stay and they and their comrades are going to fight until they have defeated Hamas and until they have destroyed Hezbollah's capacity to threaten our northern regions. If I asked them the the amount of time, they'd probably tell me six months, a year, a year and a half. But the main thing they'd say is, whatever it takes. That's why we're in the army. That's why we have a country we're proud to serve. Last question, Dan. Um, do you think this long war and 10-7 has fundamentally changed Israelis' uh, collective view of their enemies and their future? I think to a very large extent it has. Israelis have this tendency towards being naive, and roughly once a generation, that tendency is shaken up completely. It happened in the second so-called intifada from 2000 to 2004, and a whole generation of Israelis understood we have to rely on ourselves and we can't trust promises of peace from people who aren't even willing to make those promises in a full-throated, clear way in their own language to their own people. October 7th was a massive wake-up call to Israelis. We are not going to forget this, especially younger Israelis who were very hopeful about prospects for peace, and they've seen them shattered and their friends killed and tortured and raped and kidnapped. Um, Israelis are going to remember this for a long time, and we're going to be much more realistic about what our prospects are and what we have to do to survive in a very difficult region. Dan Palazar, thank you for your time this morning. I look forward to that link that you send me so I can post it and let people help you help the IDF. I appreciate it. Thank your sons for their service as well. And have a good, good day in Israel. I hope I hope those rocket barrages stop soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.